All right, cool. Let's get started. Um, all right. Uh, so thank you everyone for showing up. Um, today we have Michael Chittister, uh, who is of Wixtenauer fame. He's going to talk to us about dueling in the 15th century. Take it away. Hey guys. So I don't know how many of you know me. My name is Michael Chittister. Can't actually see you guys. I, as Charles said, have been doing Wixtenauer for the past 10 years and HEMA for about 20 now. But dueling is a very, very recent interest of mine. It actually started, uh, I think, two FNYs ago when we were sitting around the secret campfire that Ben Michaels built. And Mike, it was right after Mike Edelson and Corey Winslow had declared they were no longer going to do KDF. And Mike and me and Jake and Corey and Kendra were around this fire. And Mike was saying things, you know, like he says, like, show me a miracle and prove to me that Lichtenauer exists. And we were trying to answer his historical questions, which are totally valid historical questions about the context of Lichtenauer Longsword. And, I, and, and we kept, finally came back to, if this exists, if, if there were really unarmored longsword dueling happening, why don't we know about it? Why hasn't anyone written about it? Where would we find that evidence? And I said, well, there is one book that to my knowledge, nobody's ever translated or really looked at that could have that information. And that is the treatise of Parine del Pozo, who was an Italian, uh, who we're gonna talk about today. Kendra, can you close that window? Even if they can't hear it, it's kind of bugging me. Thank you. Um, so 15th century dueling, as described by Pernet del Pozo, oops, let me skip. Oh, we didn't. I, I put my table of contents further in. So we're going to start by saying, what is a duel? We all have an idea in our heads about the answer to this question, right? What a duel is. And I purposely chose this picture because to many of you, this does not look like a duel, does it? <laughs> so, putting from Pozo, a pact and accord were made to break 10 lances and one of the two fell to the ground in an encounter before the 10 were finished, should the battle be over without waiting to break all 10 lances. This is the first, the chapter title of the first chapter of book eight of his enormous treatise on dueling, which is 39 chapters of actual dueling incidents that occurred and how he thinks they should have been judged. So the answer he gives this one that actually in battle, falling off a horse is not usually lethal. So why should it end the duel? If they said they were gonna ride 10 pants passes, they have to ride all 10. And also 10, 10, 10 lances is a whole lot of time for the other guy to also fall off his horse. So nope, but the duel should continue. Number two, if at the same time, one wounded the other and the other the one, which wounds both died, which of them should be the victor? Okay, seems like we're changing gears quite a bit here. Um, he gives more detail in the description of the chapter that one of the guys had wounded, given the other one a mortal wound, and then sat on his chest and demanded that he yield before he die and acknowledged that he was in the wrong. And the other guy said, no, you yield. And he stabs him in the neck with his dagger. And the guy on top falls to the ground dead. And the guy on the bottom who's dying stands up, staggers a few steps, and then also falls dead. And the next of kin of both fighters go to the judge and demand who the victor was for, you know, legal reasons. And what the, uh, what the answer Pozo gives for this question of who wins when they both kill each other is that it falls on the challenger, the plaintiff, to always prove his case, not the challenged person or the defendant. So, the defendant has no obligation to prove anything beyond attend the fight and not die. Well, attend the fight and do his best. The challenger has to kill and stay alive to be vindicated. So in this case, because the challenger failed to survive, he loses. Number three, <laughs> mounted versus dismounted. I forgot to tell you what these pictures were. The first one was from a tournament book. The second one was from Gladiatoria. And this is now Paulus Cal. 
Two knights were challenged to fight on horseback, and one of them dismounted and killed his enemy on foot, should he justly be the victor. <clears throat> okay, so in this case, Pozo says, well, it, de it depends. If this were a non-lethal duel, <clears throat> then dismounting on a mounted duel would be um, illicit and he would lose. However, if this were a duel to the death, a mortal duel, then you can do any honest or dishonest thing. So dismounting on a mounted duel, totally okay. So it totally depends on the context. So those are the first three chapters of this chapter eight. And we're going to come back to other ones too, because really chapter eight is the most entertaining part of the whole book. So we'll, uh, we'll spend a lot of time there. But for now, what are we talking about? Pede del Pozo was, or he, in Latin, he's called Paridas or Paris de Puteo. If you're looking for his book in catalogs, that's actually the more common name that's listed under. What we know is he was born in Piemonte in 1410. He studied laws at universities all over Italy, right? Napoli, Roma, Bologna, Firenze, and Perugia. Um, he started in Napoli, which is basically his hometown. It's uh, on the opposite side of Mount Vesuvius from Piemonte, but it's like a 30 minute drive by car today. Very close. Um, and that's where he spent most of his life. He was advisor to Alfonso V of Aragon, right? Who, which, if you said that's a Spanish name, you're correct. But in this time, Napoli was a Spanish possession. It was not associated with any of the other Italian states. And he ended up serving as general auditor and general inquisitor to Alfonso V, in addition to working at the University of Napoli and teaching law for decades. He died in 1493. And in, even in his own time was a very famous jurist or legal expert. All right. So to be clear, this guy, not a fighter necessarily. I mean, to the extent that anybody in this period was not a fighter, he didn't have any kind of fighting occupation. And we don't know of him ever getting into any fights. So there's countless arguments to make about how everybody in this time knew the use of weapons, whatever. This picture is from the cover of one of his later books, which was made after his death. But I don't know, it's a cool picture. I need to fill up this slide. His book, he actually is famous for two books. The first one that he wrote in the 1460s was about what we would call forensic science, um, which he was an early innovator in and was talking all about rules of procedure and evidence and so on. The one that we care about, however, was written in 1470s and it's called De duelo vel de re militari in singulari certamine, Latin, um, which means <clears throat> uh, on dueling. The dueling is a word that he sort of made up or at least popularized, which is why he has to add or of military things in single combat. Dueling comes from a Latin word that basically just means double and does not in that time mean two people fighting each other in single combat. In fact, elsewhere in this book, he uses the term bataille de dos, or battle of, de, bataille de due, <coughs> in Spanish, it's battalia de dos, um, which is a battle of two. And that's what he wanted to evoke with the word duelo. Uh, but anyways, the Latin was, ah, no. Latin was published in 1471 too, and reprinted at least three times. He then had it translated to Italian, and it was published in 1476-7, and that one was reprinted about a million times. Um, it was also included by Marozzo in his 1536 book, which had its own series of like six printings, and it was translated into Spanish and English in the 16th century, um, and then republished again, finally, in an abridged form in 1590. So this is a period of over 100 years, when he was the predominant dueling authority. Not only was his book hugely popular, as you can see by the number of printings here, but also other dueling, other authors in the dueling genre, which he basically invented, uh, for the next hundred years, would specifically frame their comments as in responses to his. So whether they called him up by name or not, he was the guy that they were either answering, arguing with, or defending. 
Um, interestingly, this comes up at least one more time in the history of fencing that we care about, because a guy you may have heard of named Pedro Monte, whose massive, poorly organized fencing manual, Collectiana, was, re was recently translated by two different people in the past few years, right? Mike Prendergast and Jeff Forgang. Um, and they, he has a whole other book that's purely about dueling, which is at least as long as his fencing manual, also in Latin, unlikely to ever be translated, but people who have, who've read it comment that he's basically calling out Pozo on nearly every point and disagreeing with him about everything, but he has to, but he, he still, even though he thinks that his, his basic premise is lawyers have no business dictating the rules of dueling, only fighters do, he still has to frame his comments as a response to Pozo because that's how dueling worked back then. So anyways, Pozo, really important guy, lots of opinions about dueling, and what he was really trying to do was establish a, well, I was gonna say a common law tradition, although Will said last week that it should be classed customary law. I'm sure we can, I can ask him when we get to the Q&A to say a little more about that. Um, but he was trying to collect all of the precedents and basically all of the stories of dueling that had happened for the previous 200 years into a single book that, lo that lawyers like him could reference to understand dueling custom. <clears throat> so we're gonna continue with this by talking about what he's not talking about, what dueling isn't, is not trial by combat. And this is something that we've tended in the HEMA community and HEMA literature to really mush together in a bad way. Um, judicial dueling is nebulous and could describe either one because it's not a historical term. But trial by combat is not the same thing as the battle of two. Trial by combat is something that mostly lower class people did, um, and they mostly did it when one of them was accused of a capital crime. <clears throat> and so they would put on these cool leather cat suits and they'd fight with giant shields and clubs or sometimes swords, and there's rules about when it's a club and when it's a sword. Um, and they'd have bare feet and they would have bare hands and they'd be rubbed down with oil before they started. It was a whole big thing and it was never super common. And by the time we get to the 15th century, it hadn't died out completely, but it was basically unheard of. Like when there was a trial by combat that actually was going to happen, people would travel from all over, especially people who liked blood sport like nobles, just to see it so they could see one in their lives. It was really rare. Um, by contrast, the Battle of Two was not rare. So <clears throat> on that note, it's also not this, which I'm sure you guys have seen sometimes, right? The, uh, the man in a hole versus the woman with a flail game that people play. There's YouTube videos, look them up. Corey Winslow and Betsy Winslow did a great video of it a while back. And as far as we know, this actually, unlike long shield fighting, never actually happened at all. Um, there was, so Ariella Alema published a paper, I want to say it was last year, in which she argues that it all goes back to a duel that happened in 1288. But that duel, here's how that was represented in a chronicle from the city that it actually happened in, um, in the 15th century. So 150-ish years later, or 200 years later, um, they thought it looked kind of like this where the woman is clearly not doing anything or the man doing anything like what was in that picture right there. But as best as Ariella could tell, it enchanted public imagination. And so from there, uh, there arises a folk tale that involves a woman fighting a giant, fighting a duel against a giant. And that giant had to stand in a waist deep pit because that made him the same height as the woman. And she had a flail and he had a club. And then from there, that was so cool that it started getting written into legal texts, uh, right? The, the Saxon Spiegel and the uh, Schweben Spiegel. The German legal texts were called mirrors because they reflect legal practice instead of dictating it. Um, and then once it was in the legal texts, people just assumed that it was real. But no one has yet found any evidence of a duel like this 
never happening anywhere in Europe. Um, although people are still looking, so you know, it could be that we do find that eventually and it's just hiding. But it seems fairly unlikely. Um, so, what we're talking about then is not trial by combat, it's the Battle of Two. And that means a lot of really specific things. And this is where I'm going to segue away from these slides slightly to explain what I didn't know when I made these slides and haven't had time to really investigate enough to build it into lecture. So I'm going to give you the one minute version. Um, what we find, what I found about a week before I gave this presentation the first time was that this dueling that Pozo is describing is not a thing that he made up. It's not even a phenomenon of city people or of nobles. It's something that arises from the law of war, which is this strange sort of international set of customs that arises in the Hundred Years' War in the um, very, at the turn of the, fifth, of the 14th century. And then it sort of gets codified into rules that soldiers have to abide by and knights have to abide by in the field. It's where we get things like taking people for ransom and lots of very of customs whose real intent is to make war safer and easier to control and to make knights less dangerous and easier to control and also men at arms. But it includes a mechanism where two people who are having a dispute in camp can fight a battle between the two of them following all of the conventions of war and settle their dispute that way, but only with the sponsorship of their commanders. And it's also, you know, a convenient way that you can keep your troops entertained and occupied by having them build a big list and then stand around and watch two guys try to kill each other. So it's a phenomenon that starts that way, it begins in military camps, and it begins between so knights and men at arms, and then trickles back into the cities. When those soldiers go home, but still have problems they want to solve, they want to do it the way they did in the field. And so duels start happening in cities based on the customs of war. <clears throat> so anyways, that's the wider context of what we're going to talk about today. And in that respect, we can see Pozo as trying to solidly bring that whole dueling culture out of military law and into civil law with his battle of two. <clears throat> he also, um, and this is significant, he makes knights and soldiers equal in dueling. Um, he has this saying he likes that's called, uh, that says, arms grant nobility, by which he means military veterans by their military experience earn equality with knights in matters of fighting. So they're not social equals, but they are military equals. And this is one of the things that Monte had a big problem with, by the way, and a lot of other dueling authors did as well, the idea that common men-at-arms could ever be equal to knights. But he says, no, if you're a fighter and you've done the fighting and you've proven that you fit into this, this um, fighter class, then that's what you are, period. Um, so he also has a whole bunch of rank-based protocol, um, because even though a man-at-arms can challenge a knight, and a knight can challenge a lord, and so on, and because of their standing as soldiers, the other is required to respond, there's lots of rules about how you can respond. Um, so he's very clear that you can't ever turn down a challenge, but do you have to fight or can you choose a champion is a big question he has to, he deals with. Um, and it, so, and we'll maybe we might come back to that later on. I forget. If not, bring that up in the questions if you if you care about it, and I'll talk more about that. So, the book that he wrote, I told you, it was written in Latin and Italian. The Latin copy was written for lawyers, right, jurists, um, not for knights. And in it, it had, and it's actually very different in the first chapter for that reason. The Latin version lays out all the legal precedents for why dueling is a legitimate practice, even though the church says it isn't. He goes through Frankish law and Lombard law, and he points out that Charlemagne um, dictated 
that Lombard law should be married into the laws of the empire. Um, so Lombard law still holds sway in some cases. And his basic, and he, he, he spends several pages explaining why you should understand that a duel can be legal even though it's sometimes condemned. However, in the Italian version, he skips all of that. There's nothing about why a duel is legal. Instead, he wants to talk about why a duel is moral. And he begins with David and Goliath. <clears throat> um, David and Goliath were a powerful symbol of chivalric values throughout the Middle Ages, right? Because it's the story of one guy who through sheer martial spirit and valor and cussedness defeats a much more a much superior opponent. So knight, so this appears in all kinds of chivalric literature, and he resurrects it now as the original duel. And in this battle of two, they go out on a battlefield as, as the replacement for entire armies fighting, and God steers David to victory in spite of overwhelming odds. And then from there, he goes through various other classical illusions, right? I think Amazons come up and um, Trojans, you know, all the totally hard history of the Middle Ages. Um, <clears throat> And that's how he justifies it in the Italian version. So by and large, from what I've been able to tell, the two are very close to each other. The Latin mostly is just shorter and less flowery than the Italian. But in this chapter, they're completely different, which is interesting. Two different audiences, two different justifications for why dueling should exist. He's, so the first thing to, that, I, that you might wonder about is reasons for dueling. And he is very unclear about that. I've been through his whole book looking for that specific thing for him to explain when a duel is okay and when it isn't and have come up with nothing. Which means that either he is thought that it was self-evident or unimportant or I'm just bad at looking and it's still hidden there somewhere. I'm not sure. But so to answer that question, because it's off with the discussion of dueling um, as a practice, I went to uh, what's his name? Giovanni de Legnano, who was a different Italian writing in Northern Italy in the 1360s. So about a hundred years before Pozzo, who wrote a very short dueling work and the, at the end of a very long treatise on warfare and the laws of war. Remember how we were just talking about that. So his treatment of dueling at the very end follows those lines. But he says there are three reasons why a duel, why people fight duels. The first one is hatred, and that's totally not cool. Um, and hatred is the worst reason to fight a duel. So that's just giving into your base instincts. How, the second reason is glory, and glory is a good reason to fight a duel, but not a great one. Keeping in mind that in knightly culture, glory was considered a virtue, and, and the, uh, the whole chivalric system was sort of a cult of glory. So if you're gonna fight a duel, in order to enhance your own glory and honor or demonstrate it, that's okay, but not ideal. And the third reason he gives is compurgation. What the hell is compurgation? Well, compurgation comes from the word purge, um, or sorry, it's related to the word purge. I imagine that they both come from a different root word. Um, but what it means is to cleanse yourself or purge yourself from accusations that impinge on your honor. Right, so you could fight for glory if you want, but if someone slights your honor, then you have to fight in order to get rid of that stain on yourself. So compurgation is the only completely legitimate reason to fight, according to Legnano, uh, because otherwise you have to live with the dishonor and you can't do that. <clears throat> so the other place I look for reason to duel is Talhofer, since I don't have you in the room, I can't ask how many of you have actually read Talhofer's description of dueling, but I will say that it's kind of weird and not really reflective of any historical text I've looked at in the dueling canon. It seems almost like he was trying to imagine the way trial by combat worked based on these battles of two and ended up somewhere in the middle in his description, like trying to backwards construct it, but it's weird. 
However, the seven reasons he gives why you must fight a duel are not that weird. They're murder, treason, heresy, disloyalty, betrayal in combat, falsehood, and rape. Um, now these, I would guess, are reasons why you have to fight a lethal duel, whereas glory might be the times when you would fight one of the duels we talked about at the beginning that are non-lethal, where your goal is to, you know, take the guy prisoner, steal his clothes, take his horse, things like that, as opposed to actually killing him or dying trying. But like I said, that question is not resolved in Pozo. So I'm going to have to keep looking through other, sec other sources to try and get an idea of what the custom was. <clears throat> so once there's a reason to do it, we come to the challenge. I gave, I gave you this big wall of text, which I don't, which I don't usually like to do, because it's, to it's a totally cool quote. But he says that by military precept, you must send the pledge or signal of challenge by an officer of arms, trumpeter, or drummer. Um, so interesting thing, in the 16th century, duels were challenged by a cartel of defiance, which some of you might recall from the dueling stuff, the, the feuding stuff. That's also how you initiate a duel. But Pozo's not having any of that, no letters. You send a gauntlet as a signal of battle by an officer of arms. So we're seeing back to the military roots of this. And it's called the bloody gauntlet of battle. Um, or you can send some other armament, but usually a gauntlet. Why? Because the, the gauntlet is the most worthy for defense and guards the right hand, without which gauntlet you cannot securely work the exercise of the sword, blah, 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 without fear of incurring detriment or damage. So um, I think we all can understand that piece of it. Your gloves are pretty important. So if you send someone your only right gauntlet, then shit's getting real. Um, so, and that way, the person who receives the gauntlet will be obligated to acknowledge how serious you are and respond to your challenge. However, once you've issued a challenge, the other guy decides literally everything else. The rationale being that the challenger is the one who decided that a duel would happen, and the challenged person didn't. So therefore, he gets to make all the decisions that might give him any favor he can get because it wasn't his idea. So the only way to make it fair is to give him every advantage possible. And this is why there's a motif in literature sometimes of a guy trying to provoke somebody else to, to challenge them to a duel. So because you want the duel, but you, don't, but you also want to dictate terms. Um, so in a battle for glory, the challenger chooses the weapons. Um, although Pozo notes that in a battle for to the death, um, it's just like a real battle to the death. So all weapons are allowed, and no, and there's no rules about that. This, by the way, is not from a fencing manual. If you don't recognize it, it's just a random picture of two guys killing each other on horseback, which I thought was pretty good. There's some good blood splatter there. Um, so this is my battle to the death. So the challenged person, the defendant, also is charged with finding a prince who will host a field. Now this gets into the legalistic arguments behind dueling, which the que because the question is always, why is it not murder? Um, and in later centuries, it would be murder when dueling is really outlawed. Right now it's in a legal gray area. So the way you make it legitimate and legal is first you find a prince and the prince, you find a prince who's willing to, to host you and the prince will give you a field, um, right? Or where, and he'll have a list built. This is Talhofer's list here. It's a kind of a small thing. There's dogs fighting in it. Um, this list from René d'Anjou is probably more representative of what these were like in many times. And as I mentioned, when it comes to military commanders keeping soldiers busy in camp, building a giant list is a great way to keep a bunch of guys busy and out of trouble. Um, and they get to watch people kill each other. So some of these things have multiple purposes to them. In civil law, this becomes a public spectacle. So there's grandstands around it. Oh, the prince gets the best seat right on the 50 yard line there. So the prince hosts the field and you also have to find a judge. And I think this, this is not just any random person acting as judge, but an actual court official or legal official 
who will adjudicate the match. Um, and because you have a judge and you have a prince, they make it legitimate. So now it's no longer murder, it's a legal proceeding, except also it's basically murder. Um, and it follows then that if you can't find a prince who will agree to your terms, uh, right, because as part of the setup of the duel, you negotiate what the arms are gonna be, what the conditions are gonna be. If you can't find a prince and you can't find a judge, then the duel is not legal. Um, but that leads to what Pozo calls going to the woods, um, which is sort of a funny pun on the different, or different, a joke on the different categories of dueling, which I can't really explain because it's an Italian thing. Um, but there's a reason why it's to the woods. It, um, but what he says, and I quoted this thing in its entirety because it's kind of a badass quote. He says, some say that necessity makes many things lawful, which otherwise were unlawful. And for that, that the sword is judge and manifest witness. That he who escapes without hurt should be victorious and that he who is slain or grievously hurt is undoubtedly defeated. And in this way, a sentence of victory may be reported without a judge because the wounds do witness in place of the judge. Now, this is interesting. Uh, the turn of phrase uh, about the wounds witness in place of the judge reminds me of Fiore's description of his five quiet duels with other masters in which he doesn't say what happened. He says what the weapons were and that he went off into lonely places by himself and that he returned without wounds. No mention of the other guy, but it makes me wonder, so it makes me wonder if the whole thing about wounds witnessing is Pozo quoting something and this was actually a cultural idea that they had in Italy at this time, in the 15th century. Um, so Fiore is happy to say that he had no wounds to bear witness against him. Now, Pozo is very clear on this. This is the worst idea ever, and not okay ever, and it is unknightly and unchivalrous, and he goes on and on. He hates this practice um, and says you should never do it because that's not how warfare works. And we'll come back to this in about three slides, I think. Um, but basically the idea is, if you're not doing this in public to demonstrate your martial virtues, then you're not doing a moral thing and you should be charged with murder if you kill somebody or assault or whatever. As the dueling ritual is what makes it more than just crime. <clears throat> However, the, if we're going to find a place in history where there are quiet private fights happening, this is probably as good a place as we're going to get. And I'll come back to that. <clears throat> so how long do you have to get ready for a duel is another question he, he takes on. And the answer is that's determined by the challenged party, the defendant, but it's also really after the prince. And so we can imagine that the, that the defendant finds a prince who's willing to give him the terms he wants. But Pozo adds that if it's more than six months, then it's not really honorable anymore. So six months or less to awaken your sleeping strength, as he puts it, or, you know, get back into shape and get ready to fight. And this is just a random scene of training from a, a rather famous commonplace book whose name I forget now. Uh, but, you know, do all these things to get ready to fight your duel. Additionally, in the fighter, in the, in the defendant's favor, is this thing that he calls making the fighters equal. But what he really means is making the challenger equal to the defendant. If the defendant has disabilities of any kind, then he can demand that the fight that the challenger um, receive handicaps that give him the same disabilities, right? So if he only has one arm, the challenger has to have one arm tied to him. If he only has one leg, then he has to have one of his legs tied up. And so on, if he's blind in one eye, he has to be blindfolded in one eye. He has to receive any disadvantages that the defendant has. Well, that's a one-way street. The, the, the challenger has no right to ask the defendant to be compromised in any way. Because again, he picked the duel. He doesn't get to dictate the terms. Um, Pozo also goes on to point out that 
Left-handedness is not actually a disability. Um, and his reason for it is that the left hand is the right hand of a left-handed person. Therefore, you can't force the other fighter to share your handedness because that's already equal. You both have a hand that's dominant. Uh, but I thought that was an interesting explanation. <clears throat> so yeah, if you're a disabled person and you challenge a non-disabled person to a duel, that's your fault. Suck it up. Now, uh, so Michael, I, what? I have a quick question. Um, so you know these um, the dueling parties; they need to find a prince, yep. uh, you know, to sponsor it. What, what incentives are there for the prince to sponsor, you know, some kind of risky duel? occurring in their name? Uh, it seems like usually they would do it for the spectacle. Like this is where like all the pageantry that surrounds tournaments was also present in, the, in these judicial duels, right? It's a field that's set up in a public square. All of the town people come to watch um, and there's a big mm -hmm. party that attends it. Like it's a big deal. And it, especially uh, keep in mind the border between duels and deeds of arms and tournaments was basically non-existent. It was a spectrum. So a lot of these duels were non-lethal. A lot of them followed the conventions that fought that that were followed in tournaments, uh, knightly tournaments. Right? It's it sort of is, reminds me of the the defense right in Twisty, where you can say, yeah, okay, I might have killed this guy in a street fight, but I followed all the rules of the factual. You know, these aren't these aren't typically special rules for one situation, they're fighting customs. So in the, mm. the duel often follows the same format as the tournament. Mm. So I think that the main reason why a prince would be willing, assuming he's not a family friend of yours or something, which is a, one way you could go about doing it, is just to have a spectacle, have a party with his friends, give his um, commoners something to enjoy, and just host that. It's not like there's any risk to him for it. Mm -hmm. He's in complete control of all of it. And we'll see later, the prince can also stop the fight at any time. All he has to do is announce that it's done. And even if the victory conditions weren't met, then he throws his scepter into the ring and the fighting stops. Done. So he's in complete control. Um, and there's not really any downside except for maybe the hassle, which is why sometimes you have to wander around for a while before you find a prince who's willing to put up with it. But yeah, in many of these descriptions, the prince seems to be having a great time when you get into actual dueling records outside of these legal books. <clears throat> but beyond that, I don't know. If there were other incentives, I don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. It just seemed to be, and it may also just be a concern for the rule of law. If you don't want people to go off in the woods and, and handle this with their friends, then you have to give them an outlet to do the fighting. That might also be what gets judges involved. These guys are going to fight anyway, so we may as well make it legal and keep control. <clears throat> so I had two questions before we move on, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, first one was, I guess, how they justified the glory versus pride or any of that because it, it in a religious time like medieval period they kind of go along with the seven deadly sins when you think about it right like glory yeah. is pride and honor can also be an extrapolation of vanity and i don't know a lot that much about chivalric culture to be honest this could be something that charles is better suited to answer than me since he's done more of the reading than I have. Um, but it seems like as far as codes of chivalry go and the chivalric culture goes, there was a distinction there and that it was totally valid to, and not sinful, to be seeking glory and seeking honor and seeking to prove your honor, um, even though it would seem to us like it runs afoul of ideas of humility and so on. That just doesn't seem to be the way they understood it in this time period. All right, Charles, do I have that right? Uh, I, I am not an expert on kind of the, the high chivalric culture. Um, I could bring in someone who knows a lot about that. Um, so 
I'd be interested. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not in your club. But yeah, I, I, have, I have had that question too. And I yeah. don't know the answer, to be honest. Okay. And then my second one was what the distinction was between disloyalty and treason. Yeah. So you noticed that, right? That like four of the seven things that Tal Heffer mentions sound like they're the same thing. Yeah. Um, let's scroll back to that list really quick because we have that technology. Um, right. Treason, disloyalty, betrayal, and falsehood are all yep. sort of hazy. What's the distinction? Uh, Tal Heffer doesn't really say. Uh, Falsehood might mean specifically bearing false witness, right? Which would mean giving false testimony as opposed to disloyalty, um, which might separate you from treason based on who you're being disloyal to. Disloyalty to your comrades versus treason to your overlord, maybe. It, it's not clear to me exactly how that works. I mean, likewise, I have rape here, but what it actually says is misusing a woman or maiden, which is another broad category of things that could easily play into any other ones. I know that one of the most famous duels um, started off that way, and then but then became an accusation about lying, about mistreating a woman. Um, but that's my best guess, um, is treason is to your overlord, disloyalty is to your peers, betrayal in combat, is a specific thing, like leaving people to die in war. And falsehood has to do with legally perjuring yourself or bearing false witness against someone else um, in another way. And then <clears throat> Steve Peratsky also had a question. He asks, was Prince the actual minimum rank required to authorize a duel or was he just referencing a local authority? Uh, so Prince is a specific concept in this time period and as members of the high nobility. So I think it would be specifically somewhat, so prince does not mean child of a monarch, even though that's the association we have today. That's actually sort of a vanity thing um, when kings and queens started giving the title prince to their children. People were upset about that for the first you know, few generations because that was not how it worked. Prince means someone who's like a baron or a duke or a count, um, or a king even, or would be classified as a type of prince. And when we style the child of a king or queen as a prince or princess, that's just sort of an honorary title that the king can give you because he's absolute ruler, not because you deserve it. So prince in this case is somebody who is the ruler of some piece of land, right? A medieval fief or fief or however you pronounce that. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's a, a specific status in the feudal system. Does that say enough? And specifically, the, well, you go to a prince because a prince is a land ruler and can give you land that he owns um, and is the law on. Even though he probably has superiors in the feudal system, he has what they call suzerainty, which is limited absolute rule. That makes sense. <clears throat> um, so yeah, it can't just be whoever's in charge. It has to be a person who can make laws, basically. Yeah, so it, it and have them how, how far out of the way somebody might have to go to find someone to authorize their duel. Uh, so, when we, so pretty far in some cases, we, one of the duels that Fiore mentions in his introduction was a duel where the challenge occurred in Paris and the field was held in Italy. Pozo mentions various foreigners coming south of the mountains to fight duels in Italy um, because they couldn't find a field in their homelands. Uh, so, the, so the option, to, if you can't find anyone who's close by, is to keep looking farther and farther or just give up. And if the challenger gives up on finding a field, then it passes, or if the, if the defendant gives up, it passes back to the challenger to try and find a field. So you don't want to give up that advantage if you have any chance of, of um, succeeding. So in some cases, it seems like people would spend years trying to find a field if they, for whatever reason, were not getting any attention locally. 
Um, but yeah, like it, there, there's no limits on how far you can go. The Knights were an international class. They, they go all over the place to fight wars. Why not to fight duels? Gotcha. All right. Should we move on? Uh, Rebecca also had a question while we were discussing. Uh, could the evidence of the wounds be related to Christ's wounds as far as going into the woods? Uh, maybe. I've never thought of that. Uh, there's no overt religious mention there, but that could be uh, um, what he was referencing. Oh, I don't know that one would say that Christ's wounds bear witness against him, but <clears throat> that sounds like this kind of religious, religious illusion that I wouldn't be surprised to find. Okay, moving on. Who strikes first? This is a question that's, that's really kind of pivotal for us as historical fencing reconstructors, right? Is this speaks a lot to the context that, these, that the techniques we're talking about would fit into. And there were definite rules <clears throat> about striking first, um, or at least it's a question that dueling, the dueling authorities really, really tormented themselves about. Legnano equivocates. He doesn't give a solid answer, but he lays out legal arguments for either person. You know, he says, well, some authorities will tell you that the challenger has to strike first because in a courtroom, it's the plaintiff who speaks first and the defendant who answers. So in a duel, clearly the challenger will speak first by attacking and the defendant will answer by defending. But other authorities will say that the, defend, the challenger already had his spoke his piece by issuing the challenge and the defendant must therefore strike first in order to respond to the challenger's um, challenge, you know, with weapons, with violence. Um, but he's very clear that in every duel, one of the two guys will be told beforehand that he gets to strike first. Um, and if the other guy strikes out of turn, then it would go back to it being murder and not just dueling. So this was dead serious um, rules that we set up for this. But what Lignano ultimately says is that in matters of fighting, it could be, it might be best to just let the fighters figure it out themselves and let either one attack or defend as he will. And in the 1420s, um, Christine de Pizan, who also writes a little bit about dueling, says the same thing, that in mortal combat is not a courtroom and doesn't work like a courtroom. So you should let them behave like their fighters and not like their lawyers. But Pozo, takes a hard line on this. He sides with the people who say that the challenger fights, strikes first because there is no duel until the challenger repeats his challenge by throwing the first blow. And that's what initiates the duel. Um, <clears throat> this is very interesting to anyone who's ever wondered why there are so many techniques in our fencing manuals predicated on the other guy attacking you while you just stand there and we learn a hundred ways to deal with an attack coming towards us and almost nothing about how to attack the other guy. <clears throat> well, depending on your jurisdiction, if you expect to be the person who throws the first strike or the person who doesn't, then you'll probably train accordingly. And particularly places where the defendant or the challenger attacks first and you don't plan to ever challenge anybody else to a duel then all you really need to know is how to defend yourself when someone attacks you. This also might lead to funny things we see in fencing manuals, like unscrewing your pommel and throwing it at your opponent, or throwing your entire sword at your opponent, the way Fiore does, or throwing your spear at your opponent, like you see in Talhofer. If you're carrying just armfuls of weapons, then, and you really don't want to attack the other guy, then throwing one of them at him from a safe distance is a great way to start the duel without actually engaging. Granted, unscrewing your pommel is still kind of a silly thing to do, but who knows? Really, who knows? Um, the <clears throat> I've also been told that Fiore's sword throw can actually be a dangerous technique, but I still have trouble believing it. Spear throwing is much more believable. Uh, this also indicates why we have records of duels that go from noon to sunset 
with nobody with no significant action happening. Um, if the challenger is told that he must attack first to begin the duel, and he's really bad at that, then he might circle around for hours without actually engaging with his opponent. But, you know, you can't actually get out of it that way because typically what happens in that case is they say, well, send them home, come back tomorrow, we'll fight again. And you have to keep going until somebody dies. That's just the way it goes. Um, duels for glory, however, can end on a stalemate if you get to sundown without any significant action happening. So another uh, small difference between the, uh, the fun duel and the scary one. Next, next topic would be women in dueling. And this is a picture of an Amazon fighting, maybe not an Amazon, that Kendra found in her women in armor research that you guys saw last week. Um, can a woman, challenge, a noble woman, um, right, because women can't be men at arms, but they can be noble, can they use that status to challenge others to a duel? And Pozo says, yes, they do have standing to challenge someone who slights their honor, et cetera, et cetera, but they don't have status to fight the duel themselves. So a woman who challenges someone um, has to appoint a, champ a champion, period. There's no situation in which she can just go out and defend her own armor, honor, she has to get another guy to do it. And the reason why is maybe predictably misogynistic uh, because she sa he says that if a knight were to fight a woman and win, then he'd be known forever as that guy who killed a woman, you know, defenseless woman. Whereas if he were to lose to a woman, then he'd be known forever as that guy who lost to a woman. <laughs> so in either case, it's not fair to the guy. And so it's only fair that the woman find another man who can fight in on, her ha on her behalf to make it honorable and so on. So yeah, I was really excited when I saw the chapter heading for women and dueling and then really disappointed when I read the discussion of it, but there we are. Um, then we come to the question, what about Blosfekten? I told you at the beginning that I got to this source because I was looking for an explanation of where Blosfekten fits into history, right? Our unarmored longsword fighting. Um, and Pozo says, has a whole chapter about this. Um, and what he says is definitely, definitely not ever. Um, he gives three examples. Here's the first one of times when guys totally wanted to do this. As it brings to mind knights who, having pledged for battle, obtained a field from a prince, they had deliberated in concert to fight unarmed apart from swords and without any body armor. And with this, each one would show their medal in defending their cause. And in order to defend their lives, they had put themselves in a state such that each had the semblance of a raving dragon. <clears throat> right, so you can just imagine them going at the prince like no, no, like, no, 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 it'll be cool, right? We'll both go out there, we'll be like dragons fighting each other. And it'll be awesome and, it'll, and we won't die, we promise. Um, and seeing this on the appointed day, the prince did not want the battle he made, saying he was more suitable for vile butchers than for valorous knights. And for this work in sententiousness, he was pretty highly praised. Uh, the Latin word that's for butchers here, I think is pimps, right? In either case, they're flesh mongers and they wanna go out there and you know touch each other naked. And it's just, it's unseemly, um, but it also strikes to the heart of Pozo's argument about why dueling is legitimate, which is that it's about showing your martial virtue, your, your skill as a knight. In order for you to show your skill as a knight, then you have to behave as a knight and fight the way a knight fights in battle. So a duel is legitimate um, and your victory is legitimate to the extent that it conforms to the battlefield expectations of warfare. So doing silly things like going out with no armor is divorcing your fight from its proper battlefield context. Um, and this is, this is, that's the longer explanation he gives. And this comes up many other places where he tells you that a thing that people are doing is not okay because it has no reflection on the battlefield. It has no equivalent, right? If the person wins by behaving in a way that wouldn't win in battle, then what the hell did he just prove? is kind of where Pozo goes with this. Note that the uh, 
of the three examples he gives of unarmored duels that almost happened but didn't, one of them is one, is one of exactly two times in the whole book that he mentions Germans. And they were Germans who came south of the mountains to fight with swords and daggers. And in that case, the judge refused to sponsor the case unless they put on some armor first. Um, so that one also didn't happen. <clears throat> All right. So now we're going to get into, back into chapters, into book eight, which is my, my favorite part, and go through some scenarios of actual duels that Pozo says happened once um, and give us a better idea of what this dueling looks like. Uh, number one <clears throat> is what if both fighters ag um, agree to ride passes until one of them is unhorsed. But in the first pass, they both fall off their horses. Who wins? Answer, we go back to the general rule that it falls to the challenger to win, that then the defendant is not required to win. <coughs> so if they both fall off their horses, the challenger wins by default. However, had it been a fight for life, um, then the combat should be ended and then reinitiated the next day. I don't know how you do this in a format to fight for life, but he hasn't really explained. What happens if two fighters agree to fight on horseback and then one of them dismounts and attacks his opponent's horse? And he mentions he would do this because your opponent's armor is too good and you just can't find a way to get through it. So instead, you jump down and kill the guy's horse. <clears throat> and he, and in the details, he also says that the horse fell on top of the guy and disabled him, I think broke his leg. And Pozo's answer is that in, if this had been a battle for glory, then that would totally be breaking the rules and he would lose. But you know, all's fair in love and war. So in a lethal duel, do whatever, kill the horse, doesn't matter. Whatever you can do to win is what you do. <clears throat> and also, check out this guy's rocking swan hat. I think he totally owns up on Fiore here in terms of hat wear. So, disarming and wounding is an interesting one. A scenario where, where the, where the uh, fighters ride at each other, and one, so and by disarming he means removing armor, not taking away their weapon. One fighter knocks the other guy's spalder and gauntlet off, but in the process loses his shield. Who wins or who has the better um, outcome? To answer this, Pozo, in, Pozo has to lay out a whole hierarchy of equipment in terms of what makes the more valuable prize. And he says that a weapon is the best prize of all, followed by a shield, followed by helmet, followed by gauntlet. Notice that before he said that gauntlet was the most important one. Now it's indistinctly in fourth place. Um, but, you know, what the hell is a spalder even? Who cares? No one ever died in battle because they lost a spalder. So that doesn't, that doesn't even rank. <coughs> uh, but, but, but a shield was better than a gauntlet, so the guy who lost his shield loses. Uh, later, further on, he also does the same thing for wounds because he has various scenarios of, you know, what if two guys fight and one loses an eye and one loses a nose? Who wins? What if one guy loses an arm and one guy loses a leg? Who wins? Um, and he says that the eye is the, is the highest pr um, prize, but you can't damage the face because the face is the seat of honor. So if you damage your opponent's face, then you become dishonored. So I guess best case scenario, you stab his eye out while leaving the rest of his face untouched. And then you're golden. Um, also, an arm totally outranks a leg in terms of wounds. And we'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> However, he goes back on this almost immediately. Because then there's a scenario where two men are fighting on foot. Um, and one takes the other's sword. But the guy continues to fight until sunset without his sword. And no further action happens. Um, so who wins? Now, you're probably saying, well, he just told us that the sword is the best thing you can take away. So the guy who did the disarm wins. But Pozo says, actually, fighting 
for hours with no sword until sunset, not taking any injuries, is so badass that here the role of cool has to win, has to take precedent. So this guy clearly demonstrated the most martial virtue ever and should be judged the winner because of his tremendous feat of arms. <clears throat> Next one. Um, oh, I have a caption for this one. When a lefty fights with a righty, both are wounded in their dominant hand, which will be more honorable? Vic oh, no, sorry, and they're both injured in their right hand, which will be the more honorable, victor or loser or equal? So a duel happens where a left-handed guy fights a right-handed guy, and they both wound each other's right hand and have to stop fighting, and they want to know who's, who, who wins the duel. And especially the lefty tries to claim that he wins because he injured his opponent's dominant hand, whereas he only got hit on his weak hand, so clearly not as good. Opozo says, no dice, because fighting requires two hands, not one. So even if you're, whether you're left-handed or right-handed, you need both to defend yourself effectively in combat. So both hands should be weighed equally, no matter which one is dominant. Um, these things interest me mostly because we never really hear about lefties and righties and fencing manuals. Um, but Pozo is concerned about this in several chapters, the specific handedness of the fighters. <laughs> we have the, the classic question, what if ninjas? Uh, I hope you guys recognize this from your Fiore studies. This is one of the weirdest plays in Fiore. Um, and Pozo says, Two knights, having been challenged to mortal combat with iron shod maces, entered into the list. One brought a hollowed out mace, which, in which cavity he carried full of a pestiferous powder, which, sending it about the visor of his enemy, suddenly deprived him of the sight of his eyes in a manner that he was forced to cover them. And with this malign stratagem, he became victor, having deprived his enemy of sight and sense. So if you ever saw this in Fiore and said, what a ridiculous play that is, Pozo is backing up here. that This is totally a thing that happened once. A guy did. And Fiore even includes a recipe for the blindness powder, which is all ingredients that, yeah, those would really mess your eyes up. Um, but Pozo is really troubled by this. This chapter is actually pretty long as he goes and weighs every possible precedent he can think of. Because, you know, on the one hand, yeah, the guy won. But on the other hand, blindness powder. So he goes through and discusses mythology, right? Things that Amazons did, you know, things in the Trojan War. He talks about Lombard law and how it forbade carrying magical powder into battle um, and other magical items, <clears throat> including any kind of dust or powder. Um, and in the end, he doesn't come to an answer. He's like, you know, it seems like this is probably not legitimate because let's be honest, if this had been a regular court, you can't win over a jury by throwing poison dust in their eyes. But also, the guy won, so he invites other legal authorities to weigh in and try to develop a, re a, a hypothesis for what should actually happen here. <clears throat> Which, I don't know, I feel like modern readers would have less trouble deciding whether this is fair or not, but Pozo is not sure. You know, does it show proper martial virtue or not? It's impossible to say. Hmm. Next one. What if someone faints? But more specifically, two combatants, one having wounded the other gravely, covered his eyes upon seeing the bloody wound, and the wounded one arose and took his enemy that had wounded him who had covered his eyes and tied his hands and feet, and after a short space of time, died of his wound. So this is a duel to the death in which the guy strikes a killing blow and then faints because of the sight of blood and the guy who's dying attempts to take him prisoner before he dies to still pull out a victory. So he ties the guy up and then falls dead. And there's another case where then, you know, his um, next of kin want to know, will, will want to take the guy who lives ransom actually and say, clearly he took him prisoner by all the legitimate rules before he died, therefore give him over to us so we can ransom him back to his family. But the verdict was actually no, there are no prisoners in a battle to the death. 
the guy who dies is the guy who died. Um, and you can't just, you can't take prisoners that wasn't agreed upon beforehand. So the guy who got tied up um, still wins. And also, I hope never fought a duel again because he clearly wasn't cut out for it. <laughs> um, it's worth pointing out that it's not like, so this was a battle to the death, um, right? A mortal duel. It's not like non-lethal duels were always non-lethal, right? Nightly activities were pretty much uniformly dangerous, if not deadly. And that was part of what made knights like them so much. So people died a lot in duels for glory. People died in tournaments. People died doing all kinds of, people died in the hunt. They died doing basically anything that was a knightly pastime. And that was one of the ways where knights showed their valor and so on was risking death all the time. <clears throat> so it follows from, from this. Um, I, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, my notes don't say, but I think he indicates that had it been a, knight, a, a duel for glory, then the guy could have legitimately taken him prisoner before he died and it would have been fine. Um, <clears throat> actually, I'm reminded of a story that I came across when I was looking at deeds of arms um, around the, uh, I'm not sure if it was, it was one of the swords between England and Scotland where the border people found time in the midst of this war to host a not so friendly tournament between the English and the Scottish um, nobles who were nearby. And the record says, you know, like people died on both sides and it was great. You know, like the English were happy to kill several Scots who returned the favor. And it's just like, that wasn't, it, that was, not only was that expected, but it was also kind of shrugged off. Like, eh, that's fine, whatever. Sometimes people die and it's nobody's fault. So the last one we're going to cover here um, is duels with more than two people, which Pozo's re reasoning are still duels. And there's four on four and seven on seven <laughs> that he mentions. And these scenarios get convoluted too, because he's like, okay, so in a duel of seven on seven, three people on one side die, and one person on their side dies, but four are unhorsed. Which side wins? Um, but the rule that he always goes back to is only the challenger and the defendant matter. So what the scenario really boils down to is two knights who are going to fight a duel and a bunch of their retainers who are now required to fight with them. It's not like it's seven guys who challenge seven other guys. It's two guys who agreed to duel and 12 innocent bystanders who are also involved now. Uh, but they don't matter. The only thing that matters is what happened to the challenger, what happened to the defendant, and whoever gets the worst end of the exchange, no matter how many of his guys die or live, is the loser. Um, and that holds true across all the examples he gives. So even if you have large groups in the duel, it's still ultimately a field with two, you know, protagonists on it, and then a bunch of extras whose job is, it is to try and keep you alive and not die. But the extras have nothing to gain from this beyond, you know, maybe the honor of surviving a duel. And with that, we come to the end of this presentation. Um, I don't really have a clever wrap up here. This is ongoing research. <clears throat> and I think it's research other people are gonna have to carry forward after me because I don't have all the knowledge or skills that I need to actually pursue this the way it should be pursued. But I know that there are a lot of other people who are getting interested in this same subject. Um, <clears throat> so I'll finish this with a word or two about where this fits into the big picture of history. I mentioned that, well, so you guys can, uh, can carry on if you're interested. I mentioned that it starts with the Hundred Years' War when international armies are being assembled really for the first time. Mercenaries from all over Europe are going to France to fight in this war and they don't have shared languages and they don't have shared customs and they don't have really much in common at all beyond the fact that there's, there's action to be had and they want a piece of it. And so these customs to govern civilized warfare arise out of the need to keep everyone on the same page. And they go on to remain sort of the law of knighthood for centuries after this. And they evolve and they change, but 
uh, this whole culture of deeds of arms and duels comes out of that initial sort of first gasp of international law. Dueling moves from the battlefield, or at least the military camps, into the cities as generations of mercenaries go out and fight and learn about duels and come home and want to keep fighting duels. And by the time we get to the 16th century, if I'm not 1650, there's a sea change in dueling and everybody finally gets on the same page that dueling should not be allowed and it should be abolished and they make it illegal. But at the same time, aristocrats don't want to let it go because now warfare has changed and aristocrats don't really know what makes them special in a world where they're not leading cavalry charges. And so they latch on to dueling as a way of demonstrating their martial spirit, right, which in the feudal system is what makes them noble. And then when it becomes illegal, that just makes it riskier for them. So they feel like it's an even higher status thing to do because now when you fight a duel, you're not only risking your life, but you're risking your freedom and your status by going to prison or whatever, or getting executed. So they reframe it as from a knightly activity to the burden of nobility where you must defend your honor, even if it costs you your life. Um, but ultimately the customs don't change that much at all. And we can see a lot of the, the uh, uh, procedural elements of dueling are pretty consistent from Pozo, even into the 17th, 18th century, even if the rationale behind it changes and the weapons change and some of the expectations of the duel become different but the framework that Pozo sets up really is carried forward for a long, long time, even long after the context he imagines for it disappears. Um, <clears throat> and with that, I guess I will take some questions. So I have a question, if, if I may ask. Sure. So a lot of times, it, like with these duels, right you talked about like well what if somebody loses a piece of armor or what if somebody you know gets injured in the hand one would be tempted to think that the fight would go on who is stopping the duels is it the prince or the judge who's like oh, okay stop you lost a shield you know you injured your so, hand yeah that's a good question that seems to vary a lot so the prince has the right to revoke the duel at any time and so does the judge um, so that's, that's, in fact, there's one the situations in there um, that I didn't cover um, because they're less interesting from a fighting perspective about like, you know, what is the classic Kima tournament problem? Well, the judge throws in the stick and one fighter claims he didn't see it and, and stabs the other fighter over the stick or under it. Is that legitimate? <clears throat> and I think there might even be a distinction he makes between attacking over or under the stick. Um, but those are things that happened. The judge says, no, you're done. And one fighter either doesn't hear or just really wants to keep going and throws one last blow. And is he a murderer if he kills the guy after the judge stopped the fight? Likewise, if a prince throws his scepter into the field, it seems to be the universal sign of the prince says you're done. And the same things come up. So they have control over when the fight happens and when it stops. <clears throat> but also a lot of these duels seem to have, as part of the negotiation that sets up the duel, um, an agreement about what the conditions for ending the duel would be. And there, there certainly seemed to be some that were being fought to first blood, even in this time period. Although when you're both wearing armor and have spears and swords, first blood means something different than if you're, you know, in your shirt sleeves with small swords. But um, sometimes the first injury would stop the fight. <clears throat> and the person who gets injured would lose. And sometimes it's done much more like a joust where you've agreed to ride a certain number of passes after which the duel will be over no matter what happens. And Fiore mentioned some of those duels as well in his introduction, but those included foot combat where you're going to fight, you know, I think that was one that was three passes on with lances on horseback and with axes, swords, and daggers each on foot. So these weren't all open-ended fights. Some of them were had very clearly specified beginning and end conditions. Okay, thank you.
would some of these be more or less a round and part of a tournament as in okay these folks have done their passes now next up so and so and so and so is going to duel over this honor thing that happened three months ago not that i've seen um they seem to be separate and the duel in particular has a whole lot of leg legality around it so they tried to sort of sandbox i i was i seem to understand but I don't know. I can't say that never happened. Um, it seems to be a separate arena that would need special arrangements, though. It, it's certainly not a thing that's going to happen with the same frequency as tournaments, most likely. Hey, Michael. Uh, I have a, a kind of a multi-part question here. Um, uh, can you speak up? I can't hear. Yeah. Is that better? Uh, yeah. OK. Um, so my question uh, has to do mostly with the, the context of, of, of Pozzo's um, uh, writings here. So um, the first part of the question is, is this, uh, is his interpretation of kind of the, the codification of dueling um, in a strictly Italian context, or is this kind of a pan-European uh, understanding of, of dueling that, that he's trying to um, give us some, some insight on? That's something I've struggled with. So the broader culture that he's drawing on is pan-European, but Italy has had a reputation for a long time as being the, the birthplace of dueling, um, possibly because of Pozo and, and other writers like him. And it's, it's hard to say how much of what he's describing for that reason was an Italian phenomenon and how much is reflective of, of other regions. We don't have a German Pozo to describe to us what Germans were doing in the same time period, or a French one, and, and so on. So what, what needs to happen in order to really validate this as a pan-European um, practice, and not just a uniquely Italian one, is digging into chronicles and digging into legal records and trying to find evidence of the same, of the same sorts of activities happening elsewhere. And I haven't done this research, and as far as I know, nobody has. I found a handful of German duels, by which I mean like maybe more than 10 and less than 20, um, in various records, none of which would be outliers in this format, but that's a far cry from saying that all over Germany this was happening. Um, we do, there is mention of both French and German people coming to Italy having already worked out the duel they want to fight, um, which could indicate that they, were, that they were going there because they tried to fight at home and couldn't find the field, or it could indicate that Italy was the place you went if you wanted to fight, period. So I have more questions than I have answers about that, but that's a really important thing that people need to be looking for who have the language skills that I don't have. Um, if we really want to develop deeper understanding about dueling in the 15th century. So I can say for now that it seems to be reflective of things that were happening in different parts of Italy, not just Naples, but outside of Italy, I just don't know. Well, uh, the reason I ask is because uh, as you were talking about some of these larger scale duels, like, you know, kind of a seven on seven deal, I started thinking about um, the combat of the 30 um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the 14th century. I was kind of curious about uh, what kind of accounts exist for, um, as I understand it, the combat of the 30 is more of a, a martial, um, you know, it's sort of a battle really than a, than a duel um, since there are so many uh, combatants in it. But uh, I'm wondering if there's any, uh, any accounts of, of something um, kind of on that scale um, that might also shed some light on uh, whether or not this was more common than not. So the biggest that Pozo talks about is seven on seven, but I don't see why his logic couldn't extend to 30 on 30, even though he doesn't mention it. Um, to the broader question, there's a, what we see a lot in Chronicles in the 14th and 15th century are different kinds of deeds of arms and sort of and nightly shenanigans along those lines, which it seems like to Pozo, those would all be categorized as duels. So in that respect, we can look at French records and English records 
and see knights doing things that resemble the duel for glory that we have in Pozo and in Legnano 100 years earlier. And so we could easily say that that's manifestations of the same thing. Um, but I, I would want to know more about the legal underpinning of it all before I could really, because that's what Pozo is ultimately doing, is he's using these things as examples to demonstrate what the law is or what he thinks the law should be. Um, so without that basis of comparison, it's hard to say, uh, it's hard to draw the perfect equivalence. Does that make sense? There are certainly narratives from, from across Western Europe and probably also Eastern Europe where I haven't looked that line up with what Pozo describes, but that may or may not mean that the system that he described was present. Yeah, or just sense. things that were superficially similar. I, it's, it stands out to me as uh, an interesting sort of outlier um, historically because the Comet of the 30 was, was uh, meant to be um, sort of a, a way to determine succession in a um, uh, in, in Brittany, right? Um, so it, it did have more of a judicial sort of context than an actual mm -hmm. honest to goodness battle. Um, so that, I, that's why I ask. I, but it does make sense that you know maybe we just don't have enough kind of uh, evidence there to make a, a really compelling decision. But you know that that's really kind of what Pozo is driving at, though, is that these duels shouldn't be treated as a special kind of fighting. They should be treated as an instance of warfare that happens to only have two, two soldiers in it. You know, armies of one, to borrow the old US Army recruiting solo uh, slogan. Um, but an army of 30 on 30 would be the same idea of, we're going to follow the rules of war, but with surrogate armies instead of real ones. That's kind of how he envisions dueling um, as, and his place in society. So the parallel there is certainly strong. I just don't know what it means. All right, other questions? I've actually got one. Um, yes. You were mentioning earlier, it, it struck me that uh, a lot of the, the legal characteristics of this came out of, um, sort of originated out of the Hundred Years War and sort of international gathering of forces. And it struck me that the other previous large historical medieval international military event were the Crusades. And I'm kind of curious that nothing kind of emerged in the record from the Crusades. Um, maybe the societal differences were different or a few other things, but it, it just struck me as, as interesting. Yeah, I, I have nothing to say about that. I don't know what the situation was. I mean, I feel like I've heard random anecdotes of duels happening during the Crusades but I don't know if there was anything similar. Or and I also don't know, I mean, it may be that the nature of, war, of the war was different that time. This was a, a quasi-religious war that was happening far away um, and had a different social value perhaps from the Hundred Years War, which really, I don't know, knights just seemed to show up because they, have, they were bored and wanted something to do, as opposed to Crusade, which was a much more regulated affair. And maybe that's part of why it was harder to keep men at arms in the Hundred Years' War under control than it was Crusaders, or possibly it was less important during the Crusades to keep them under control at all. Um, but I certainly haven't done the research to say if there was any similar cultural phenomenon in that time. That's too many centuries before anything I've studied. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's pre-KDF as we know it, but it struck me, as I said, it struck me just because uh, the, the, the Middle Ages, if anything, at least being a legalistic period, you'd figure mm -hmm. some of the stuff would have survived in precedence if any of it kind happened, so to speak. Yeah. So, just food for thought. <laughs> I mean, it could be something that's waiting for us in records that haven't really been studied by the right person yet. That's the thing about all of this. Um, so this dueling that I've, that I've talked about today and the international legal underpinning that I've mentioned has been known by legal experts for, you know, since it was, since it was happening. Like you can find commentaries by the 20th century and before that 
talking about this, but it's news to HEMA because those people didn't care about the fighting and they really didn't care about the dueling. They cared about the big picture military law that dueling was an example of. So it never really appeared on our radar until people like Ariela and Lema went looking for it specifically and then turned up sources that we haven't exploited. So, um, and I guess in a small way I have as well. So it's one of those things that totally could be lurking out there in history for us to find once the person who's looking for it actually gets there. Um, but dueling as a historical phenomenon is not what interests 15th century researchers or 14th century. Most people who write about dueling are interested in either the 16th century and onward or are interested in medieval trial by combat. So this falls into a weird sort of void in the historiography of dueling. Um, and like I said, I found evidence that no one's brought up before and I didn't even look very hard. So I assume there's probably a lot more out there for us to find, you know, or future HEMAists who have the right training. Uh, but in a lot of cases, we just haven't looked yet, I think. <clears throat> Excellent. Can you can you tell everyone the story of the paper armor? Okay, yeah. So there were so like I said, section eight has thirty nine chapters, many of which have more than one story in them. So there's a whole lot of anecdotes of warfare that exist in um, in this book, and most of the earlier chapters, when he's talking about legal principles, also have stories to illustrate them. So really, if I were to just like extract all of the dueling situations that he describes, it would end up being almost as long as his book. Which is why I haven't done it, even though that's the part that's interesting to me. You may as well just translate the whole thing. But one of the ones I didn't cover um, is a scenario in which fighters agreed to fight on foot with pole axes in full armor. <clears throat> and so they go out there, the feed, they go the, the, on the day to the field, and one fighter grabs his axe and rushes his opponent and strikes him on his helmet so hard that he starts bleeding out of his helmet. And so the judge stops the, stops the duel. And only at that point did anyone realize that the fighter who won, apparently, was wearing armor made out of parchment that had been carefully and cunningly painted to look like steel. Um, with the rationale, he said, that with paper armor, he could be lighter and faster than his heavily armored opponent. <clears throat> and you would think this, so, and the question that Pozo has is, is did he abide by the rules of the duel, which was to wear armor and, you, and, 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 and use axes? And you'd think this would fall in his book under the same provision as fighting unarmored duels, because that's basically what the guy did. You know, parchment armor is not actually protected, believe it or not. So he went out there wearing his armor Halloween costume. And, but Pozo takes the other direction and says that in doing this, he showed so much valor and so much courage in rushing an armed opponent with no armor um, and defeating him that he should be awarded the victory even though his armor didn't technically qualify. And there you have it. So he was basically wearing the equivalent of a child's cardboard armor. But he won the duel. And that's just scary as shit to me because I don't know. I could kind of imagine doing an unarmored sword fight, but an unarmored axe fight is a whole other deal. And also you have to wonder, like that must mean that servants spent a lot of time making this parchment armor. Like you know, pasting it together or whatever they were doing. How did that even happen? Why did this guy have this armor? And how did he keep it a secret for so long? There's another one where, like in ridiculous accounts of duels, someone who sowed the field with calc crops the night before, which he knew where they were. And another one where a guy brought a number of, uh, I believe they were glass spheres that were full of an explosive compound that he was throwing on the ground, like just minor, you know, little bursts of flame. And he was throwing them on the ground in front of the other person's horse to keep it from charging. 
um, and try and spook the horse. Like some of these things are just ridiculous shenanigans that apparently happened and needed to be addressed whether these are legitimate things. <clears throat> I don't recall offhand what the, his conclusion was about the guy who brought um, the fireballs to the field, but I'm pretty sure the guy who brought, who sewed with caltrops, he said should have been disqualified for using an unauthorized weapon. Is that right, Kendra, do you remember? Oh yeah, 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 you're right. The fireball guy, um, for some reason, that was considered legitimate, unlike the blindness powder. Even though you'd think the same rules about bringing magic into the field should apply there. Uh, but the caltrops was a funny one that I just don't remember the answer to. So there are numerous <coughs> little stories of of shenanigans people pulled, and also the same sorts of arguments that come up in HEMA tournaments. Like I said about you know <clears throat> if the judge calls halt, the fighters don't halt. What happens? Bickering over points, like with the if both guys get injured, who injured the other guy better? And some of these things really kind of strike me as gamesmanship, which you wouldn't expect so much in a lethal contest or potentially lethal contest. But that may just be why I'm not a knight and they are, because I don't see the world that way. So other questions. So you mentioned a bunch of scenarios uh, pertaining to legal code discussions. Does Pozo talk about any legal repercussions from these kind of quasi first-hand accounts? No, by and large, he does not, um, that I recall. Uh, generally, the idea is that if you follow the rules, I mean, the legal repercussions would be you lose the duel and are punished accordingly, which either means that your opponent takes you prisoner if it's a, an honor duel or you get executed if it's a lethal duel. So there's that for breaking the rules. But as far as external consequences for fighting the duel, he seems to believe that if the rules are all followed, then it's perfectly legitimate and there are no repercussions. I imagine the guy's family won't likely to kill him, but that's, you know, a different thing. Okay, cool. Hey, Michael, uh, this is William Busher. I just wanted to, um, you mentioned earlier in the talk, the distinction uh, between uh, customary law and common law. Um, yes. And I can just speak to that if, if you like. And I also have a, a quick question as well. Yeah, I was curious what you had, to th what you thought about that since we talked about it a little bit last week. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, we did talk about it, yeah, last week at the end, in the after hours section, which I don't know if that gets recorded or not, but um <laughs> Yeah, we may be we may we may be off the clock at this point, um, but yeah. So so the uh, it, it sounds to me that the um, <clears throat> that the the custom of dueling was was kind of uh, was was very you know it varied place to place. You know, obviously Germans versus Italians, etc. And it strikes me that um, that that there's a modern uh, notion in, in modern kind of international uh, legal theory of of customary law, which is which is actually the, the predominant you know, system of law around the world today, uh, unlike what you might think. But, but the, the way the customary law works um, is unlike what, it, it's, not, it's not the law that we think of as you know, written down, but rather it's uh, as a result of continuous iteration and continuous kind of, I guess, you know, litigation of what's fair. And, you know, and so, so it's, it exists in most parts of, um, in, of Africa, for example. And and so the the, the interesting um, the interesting uh, account uh, of um, uh, for from po or, or the, the interesting history of, of of colonialism with with regard to law um, is is that when the colonial uh, powers colonize you know they colonize Africa they brought with them the idea that hey we should write down laws whereas previously and in, in a lot of places even today the law you know customary laws are not really written down they're well they're more fluid but by writing down the the, the, the practices, the customary practices, it sort of set them in stone and created, created a rigidity that, that, uh, that, would, that, that was not a part previously of the customary law system. Because the customary law system really, it, one of its benefits is its, um, is its fluidity and it can change to, to you know, change in contexts. 
so so I guess my um so so that's custom airline similar to common law because in, in the way that we understand it because common law kind of you know judges the the idea of common law is that judges can make law it doesn't have to be written down by a by a legislator somewhere for it to be law mm -hmm. rather the judge can interpret a law and in that interpretation becomes binding and that's that's what we that's common law but it's still like a process of of interpretation and, and writing down uh, the law and or, or rather the you know, the, the law um, and the practices. So I guess my question, and I don't know if any, if, um, if this came up in your research, is, um, is what, what Pozo's objective was for, for writing down all these laws. Because it strikes me that he is embarking, I mean, in retrospect, it seems like he's embarking on that colonial sort of, you know, project of, hey, let's, if we just write them all down, we can make a system, up, right? <laughs> But but I don't know. But I, I don't understand. So for one thing, I don't understand the the way the legal the medieval legal system worked. And I think that it's also we should also caution ourselves with either with with bringing our modern notion of legality into the picture, where where how we talked about in the um in the feud feuding uh, uh, talk that you know the legality could come from multiple sources. It doesn't. It's not only from the state. It can be from multiple different vectors. You know, there's multiple different authorities here. So I'm just, I guess I'm just curious what, what's Pozo trying to do here? Do you, so do you, do you have any ideas? not entirely clear about that. My understanding is that what he's, uh, was that his goal is to, is to take this concept that was well established in military law and sort of sporadically craps up in town law and try to show that it um, and, and try to establish it in the context of civil law um, for him to to estab to justify and establish a context where this military dueling could be supported by cities and and happen in cities divorced from the military class so it's like he was trying to transport these concepts and practices from one realm into another um, and show that not only do can soldiers fight duels in the field, but that the nobility should be entitled to this anywhere they go, um, in cities and so on. So, and maybe to an extent he was trying to classify or to codify the customs into this a more common law framework. But his primary objective wasn't so much to um, establish dueling law or to create dueling law as it was to uh, show that the dueling practices are legitimate for civilized town people. And he chose to do so by laying out all of the customs into a comprehensible system. Okay, Please, sure. that's my read as a non as a non legal expert. I mean, it could be that I'm missing the mark there, but that's the yeah, impression I'm, I get from all of his writings. I'm interested in pursuing that that uh, that idea because I've never studied any kind of legal history, so I'm interested in seeing what the actual legal <clears throat> context was for his writings. That may be that may be worthwhile. Um, do you, so do do you have like a bibliography for this, or can I just you know just uh, talk to you separately? Hit me up uh, tomorrow, and I'll dig out some places for you to start. I okay. don't. My my stuff has primarily been just looking at primary sources, and especially um, Giovanni de Lagnano, uh, Christina Christine de Pizan, and Perdi del Pozo. So I've just been working with the actual legal opinions, and I know that there's a sort of penumbra of other documents out there that I just haven't dug into. Some of them are even in English. So I can send you some some start some starting points. I appreciate <clears throat> it. Yeah, because it, it occurs to me that that, you know, his writings may be accessible to multiple different, I guess, interpreters of the law, judges, so to speak, which which, you know, could be appointments of local you know, the, the king's judges or or whoever. You know, we have this kind of this kind of English, you know, basis for everything, but you know, the Lord if, or whoever would, would be, who, who would have jurisdiction over these events may be interested in, in determining, Hey, what's actually, you know, what was the outcome here? Like all this, you know, insanity happened. Like, how do I, you mm -hmm. know, how do we make sense of this retroactively? You know? 
And Pozo was certainly a legal theorist and a, and a law professor who was trying to influence legal practice. You can see that in his other book where he was trying to establish rules of evidence um, and investigation, a whole different realm of legal activity where he was trying to exert influence on the way Italians were practicing law. So this certainly fits into that sort of, uh, I guess, career path. Um, yeah, like I know. So, also, so the, uh, the the text of Pozo. Since I prepared this lecture, I've had I've got someone to transcribe the 1580 English translation, which is only in one manuscript, um, which is on Wicton Hour. So I can send you guys a link to that. It's not. I mean, it's got all the funky early modern spelling and so on, and it's not a great translation, but it's an adequate translation of the Italian. Um, which, <clears throat> if you really want to do a deep dive, you can try and go through that and get a sense of everything that's in the book. Um, but right now, it's just the, the raw transcription on Wicked Hour. Cool. No, if I ever publish, that will be my sanity check for my translation. <laughs> I'm, I just wonder, last thought I have is that if um, if Pozo is writing for an audience, you know, to be persuasive to to jurists, um, as an audience, he may be selectively in like t selecting certain uh, accounts or, 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 you know, or, or being, he may, he may have exerting some kind of bias in his work, you know? Oh, totally. That's why I say that the next step for someone for, for serious work on this needs to be digging up as many stories of actual duels as we can find to compare them to his record and see if it's the same or if he's twisting things, or if he's only capturing a certain aspect of it. <clears throat> or, you know, if, if the things he described never seem to have actually happened. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways that could play out, but I think that the answer to those questions has to be in the actual records. <clears throat> right now, we just have to take his word for it. Okay, we run out of questions now. I have another yeah. one. Oh. <laughs> Go for it. Last one, if you want. Okay, last one. Sorry, I don't want to keep anybody up. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So uh, it, it occurred to me that um, these duels sort of sound sort of like contracts. That um, that they'd be, you know, the terms of the of the duel would be litigated beforehand, and then the duel would play out, et cetera, almost, you know, as if you know, you'd go to court or something. At least that's how uh, that's how he's describing it, you know, because he is a jurist. Um, but I, I guess I'm I'm curious. So we we kind of it seems it sounds to me it's less like a like um, it, it's almost like an arbitration procedure in that the way that we understand it. So like so for an arbitration, for example, it's like a pseudo it, it's a it's a it's a pseudo legal procedure where you you know if you if you read the fine print of all these you know contracts of adhesion that you sign to access any kind of website or anything you may see that you know you, you're agreeing to arbitration and it disputes it happens a lot with like going to best buy or something some big box store that if you want to sue them you don't actually have that right you sign it away when you when you bought your tv instead you have to go to a to an arbitration an arbiter on, that's chosen by the uh, by the company um but but nevertheless, those terms are, are, are explicitly enforceable against you in modern day you know, courts. So it, it strikes me that the dueling like this may be sort of similar in that, that, the, uh, that, you know, that, that the, the two parties would, would, uh, could, could really tailor the terms very bespoke to their, to their particular you know, desires. And then, um, and then find a, a, an arbitrator, basically, you know, and, and, and the form of a lord somewhere to to adjudicate it or, or to hold it. But then there's the mm -hmm. further. But my question is this: there's the further wrinkle of what, like, whether the what's legal here, and it's almost like, you know, post mortem, you know, both of them die, or you know, both the participants die, or one of them dies. What was the legal outcome? I'm just curious about do you like who who's deciding that legal outcome? It's almost like an estate proceeding, you know, where there's a big pot of money where you know the dead person has an estate and now everyone's fighting over it. Like, do you know like what's the? It, it seems what? like that's the reason why you have to have a, a legitimate judge there, um, is to handle those legal matters. Although, 
it's what's less clear to me is the whole process of negotiating terms and how much um, is open for negotiation within those terms. Because at first blush, it seems like everything is fair game. But as I dig more into the examples that he gives, a whole lot of it seems to be predetermined um, and required by custom and not agreed to, not just negotiated by the fighters. So it's unclear um, to what extent any, to me, to what extent any of it is, or um, how many of the parameters are open to negotiation uh, before the duel begins, and how many of them are purely matters of custom that you have to just accept mm -hmm. when you fight it, when you're going to fight a duel somewhere. Um, but as far as arbitrating the outcome, that seems like it, it's the judge who's doing all the work there. And it's what he agrees to when he takes on the role of judge for the duel. I guess but that's where that the, the, the you customer have to have both a prince and, a, and, a, and an actual legal judge. I see. And that makes sense from the customary law perspective in that the, the two litigants, so to speak, the duel, the duelers would, would be bound by customary law themselves, you know, mm -hmm. and that could shift based on context. But yeah, so Pozo talks a lot about the, the covenant of the duel, um, which is, seems to be the contract that, that powers it, so to speak, but he doesn't really give a lot of information about the negotiations themselves or how the covenant is, is agreed to and and so on, if it's actually written down. So questions I have like that, I haven't been able to find answers to. Um, <clears throat> and that's why I have some hesitation about answering that piece of it, just because I wish he was much more specific about the negotiations, but he's not. Mm -hmm. It just seems pretty apparent that there are some. Yeah, I, it, there, in in modern modern legal theory, there's in contract theory, there's an idea of the consideration. You got to have consideration for a contract to be valid. It's kind of kind of this idea, of like, well, you know, there has you have to have some skin in the game, so to speak, you know, monetarily mm -hmm. nowadays. And I think the the idea of it's it, for me, if you think of it from that contractual lens, it, the idea of like valor at stake or life at stake is that consideration, and then the other terms may be may very well be dictated by you know custom and maybe some negotiation as well. So it's interesting to I don't know I'm just I'm, I'm going to try to find some good um, good legal history uh, texts to to see to see what people have uh, thought about this beforehand. <clears throat> Awesome. Like I said, the, the, I think there's, there's tons more work to be done on this. Um, I know that, that Ariella is getting back into it again, and there are other people who are trying to do the dueling research, but a lot of it seems to require subject matter knowledge that I just don't have um, in terms of the legal landscape of this time period. Um, so if you want to dig into that era, that would be a huge contribution. Um, I imagine that it's not quite the same as the way the legal system works now, but you probably have a head start much more than I do. <laughs> yeah, I can, yeah, it's, it's, it's understandable at least. I think, yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to do that. <clears throat> that sounds exciting. Good quarantine project. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Well, it's getting late. Uh, I don't, I want to respect uh, Michael's time. Uh, so I uh, just want to say thank you for uh, giving this talk. And uh, I just want to tell everyone next week we are having, uh, I am talking, I'm going to be talking about concealed and light armors of the 15th century. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. And uh, uh, for those of you who don't know what Wichtenauer is, you should check it out. Uh, it's a large repository of free uh, sources, uh, the, all of the manuals that are nearly all of the manuals that we use are available on it. And um, yeah, check it out.